I mentioned praise being a weapon. Prayer is also a spiritual weapon. It's, it should be our default when things go wrong. It should be the thing that we filter major life choices through. It, it should be the thing that we turn to when things are happening that are going wrong. It should be our first stop. And I want to say thank you to this church for making prayer a priority, making a prayer, prayer a priority in your life, and making prayer a priority in your church, and making a prayer priority before services, and prayer a priority whenever we get together for prayer meetings, because prayer is important. Look at someone beside you and say, I'm a person of prayer. I'm a person of prayer. Say somebody else, I'm a person of faith. I'm a person of faith. We are people of prayer and people of faith. And I want to preach to you this morning under this thought, what faith does, what faith does. And I know some people are facing some things in their lives, in their homes, in our church right now, and I want to minister to that. What faith does, because what your faith does is all important. It's all important. It was a village on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. His ministry was so closely related to this village that Matthew referred to it as his own city in Matthew chapter 9. And at least for some time, according to what I've found in study, Jesus even went and lived there. In comparison to some of the neighboring cities, it was pretty small. It wasn't that big. But even though it was small, it still held some regional importance with commerce. Fishing and trade were very important economic engines. And it even had a Roman tax poll station. where People would go and pay their taxes, be counted. But more important than economics was its spiritual significance. The small town of Capernaum was referenced 16 times in the Gospels. Just a small town, a small place. But you know, that's the thing about God. God works in big ways and small things. Scripture tells us despise not the day of small things. Because even in small things, he can work big miracles. That was no different this particular day. Jesus had come to a house to preach and teach. And people kept coming. Some were friends. Some disciples. Some came because they were curious, having heard the miracles that he had been doing. Some others were there as inspectors. They were inspecting what Jesus was doing. They had doubts. Some, even openly now at this point, had begun to oppose him. But they came from every town of Galilee, came out of Judea, even from Jerusalem. They came to see Jesus. They came to hear Jesus. They came to witness his ministry. They kept showing up and kept showing up until it was impossible that any more would even get into the room and then that any more would get into the house, that any more would get in through the doorway until finally Mark 2 and 2 tells us that they couldn't even get near the door. They couldn't even get near the door. They were surrounding the house and I imagine windows being open and people being crowded around the windows. And I imagine people leaning above others trying to get their ear up to hear 
the words that are drifting out of the windows and drifting out of the doorway so they could hear and witness the ministry of Jesus Christ. They couldn't even get near the door. Mark also goes on and says that he preached the word to them. That's a curious thought to me, the word, preaching the word. John said he was the word. John 1, 1 through 4, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light of men, and these that came on this particular day came to hear that word preach a word, delivering a word, life, the words of life. I don't know about you. Actually, I think I do. But I know for myself, I need the word. I need the word to preach the word to me. I need that life-giving word to be brought into my life. I need him so real and so authentic in such a way that's the importance of a real relationship, more important than the relationship I have with my wife or my children, the word preaching the word to me, something moving in my heart and in my soul, the life that he gives, the, the miracles that he does, everything that he is able to do working in my life. I need the word to preach the word to me. Amen. But then it leads me to another question. Do they think or do you think that they were aware of who they were with. Do you think they were aware of what they were really witnessing, that they came out of neighboring cities and towns and neighboring the Judeas and, and the cities of Judea and Jerusalem and coming in and trying to press in through the doorway? Do you really think they were aware who they were with? Maybe some were, but I would offer that most probably were not. You see, where awareness is a challenge. Awareness is a challenge for most of us. I saw a video on social media this week of a family hearing some noises coming from their crawl space under their home and Decided to find out what it was. And noises, a little hissing. Maybe it's a snake. Maybe it's something else. And they had it cornered up against the doorway of the getting out from under the crawl space. And they had something, I assume, was some kind of a smelly cleaning agent. Might have been just some hairspray. I don't know. What do you go after a thing under your crawl space that you don't know what it is but they had a spray bottle and they kept spraying spraying and what, what is that sound oh all of a sudden the person says oh it's a raccoon until it popped its head out the door and it was a bear not a raccoon a bear and the woman filming in her lack of survival skills, just kind of watched until the bear made a good way out the door and then decided to run. Situational awareness. I think when somebody said, it's not a raccoon, it's a bear, I would have been like, I'm done filming. She filmed a little while longer, about became a bear snack. Maybe you've seen those social media posts of people throwing up a picture, an image, and saying, I was taking this picture, and I, I didn't even, I wasn't aware that I caught this, and there's something in the image there. Or maybe they throw up a picture that says, I, we were taking a, a picture, and look who photobombed us, and in the background there's some smiling celebrity who's popped in, totally unaware, didn't even know they were there until we put this up. Unaware 
How would they have acted had they known the celebrity was right there? I guarantee you it wouldn't have been a photobombed image. It might have been like, hey, get in here with us. You got time to take a picture? Would these that came to that house to hear Jesus, would they have acted the same way had they been aware? Aware of who they were sitting and listening to, aware of what would transpire in that home, aware of what he was capable of doing, aware of what he intended on doing. We know they weren't aware because Luke 5 and 17 says the power of the Lord was present to heal them. To heal them. But how many were healed on that day? Only one. Only one. You see, we can be so unaware. We can act as though what we're doing doesn't matter. Or we can make the mistake of sitting and waiting for God to do something. When his presence is already here. His presence is already known. The power of the Lord is here. The power of the Lord is to heal, to save, to deliver, to set free, to bind up the brokenhearted, to do a work in our lives, and he is here. But how unaware, how unaware. And I preach to you today under this question, what if we came fully aware of what the Lord would and could do every time we come together? What would we do in prayer? What would we do in worship? What would we do in a service at Branches Church? What would you do? What would you change if we were aware that God and his presence were here and he was ready to heal, he was ready to deliver, he was ready to set free, he was ready to do all that you had desire in your heart for him to do that lined up with his will according to the word of God. What would we do? How would we respond? How would we act? I, I don't think we would keep going on with our normal routine our approach would change. Our approach would change. We'd never be late. We'd never consider any other option other than being here. We'd never consider anything that would take us away from a church service or a prayer meeting we would never miss anything, a fellowship. We would be so aware that he is here and that he is moving and that he is doing a work that we would never miss a service for some flippant reason that we can come up with and concoct. If we were sick, his presence would be the first place that we'd want to end up. It would be the first thing we'd want to seek out. It'd not be the place we avoid and say, I can't be there because I'm sick. After all, the healer is there. After all, the one who can deliver is there. The one who can do the miracle that no one else can do is there. And if asked if we were available, we would probably not give an emphatic yes for extra time at work. We would probably say emphatically, no, I've got something way more important that I'm going to be a part of. The casual Sunday approach that is so common among American Christians would go out the window. The take it and leave it of faith buffet of the United States would go out the window. Why? Because we were aware that God and the power of God to heal them, to do a work there is present. I'm not trying to bring shame on any of us or skin you too close to the skin as a sheep shearer should get really close but I'm trying to challenge us to think about what does faith do and in this story 
I can see exactly the picture of what faith does. Because as there's people that gather in and press into the room and fill up the house and swell to the point where they're going out the doorway and they're crowding the windows, it gets so intense that no one can get any closer. There are some men who come that they have faith. They're not there for any other reason. They didn't come with the thought that maybe something Jesus would say today would encourage them. They did not come with the idea that maybe today would be the day that he says something really profound that stirs my life. They came with one reason, to be sure they got into his presence. The presence where there was power to heal them. But others had went unhealed. This is what faith does. Faith struggles. You say, oh, that's good because I'm struggling, Pastor. Good. Faith struggles. They carried their paralyzed friend on a bed. Now, if they came from next door, they would have been earlier on time when they found out Jesus was there. But they didn't. They arrived at the point where they couldn't even get through the doorway. So you know for a while they had been struggling to carry their friend because faith struggles. Faith says, you know what, I, I believe over here God is working, and so whatever I have to do, I'm going to get there. I'm going to carry the load that has come to me, and I'm going to get to where the presence of the Lord is at. I will struggle with my faith because faith struggles. Faith is willing to put that effort in. The next thing that I notice is faith is not deterred. They tried the door, but couldn't get near. They went to a window, the bed wouldn't fit. They decided where's the next best place. There's no other way to get in. There's some stairs going up to the roof. Let's take the roof. There's no access on the roof. That's okay. We'll make our own way. They didn't let the lack of a doorway hinder them. They didn't let the window hinder them. They didn't let the lack of access hinder hinder them. It didn't matter to them whether it was a doorway, a window, or a hole they made in the roof. We'll get in the presence of Jesus because that's what faith does. Faith is not deterred. Faith says, I will make it. Faith overcomes obstacles. They broke open the roof. Now, everything that I've read about roofs in that time, they were made out of either thatch roof, specifically this one was made out of tile because the Word of God says they broke up the tiles. They took up tile. And what it would be is there'd be tile with fabric underneath it to support the weight of the tiles, and they would break that up. But did they come prepared to break up the tile? They weren't ready for that. But somebody said, you know what? I got something around here that will get those tiles up and open. And somehow they started moving tiles out of the way. It may have taken them a while. I don't even know if anybody noticed when they first started doing it. They probably didn't. They probably just kept on going listening to Jesus. But after a while, there's a good size hole, hole enough to put a man through that's paralyzed on a bed and lower him down. But it didn't matter. There was no obstacle going to stay in their way. They had to get into the presence of the Lord, the place where there was healing happening, the place where there was power that was ready to heal them. They moved that all out of the way because faith overcomes obstacles. And faith holds up. They let their friend down through the roof because their faith held him up. Think about that for just a moment. Their faith brought him to his healing. 
you know, faith is not just for you. Your faith is for someone else. Your faith is to hold someone else up. Faith holds up under pressure. And they got him through the hole and lowered him down. They continued the struggle with faith just to get him in the presence of God. And faith is visible. Faith is visible. Three times it's recorded that Jesus saw their faith. Matthew 9, Mark 9, and Luke 5. And any time, anywhere where Scripture says something multiple times, it means you should take note of what's being communicated there. And it says two places Jesus saw their faith. In one place it says he saw their faith. Jesus saw their faith. And even though the story has some variation through either one of those gospels, each one include that Jesus saw their faith. And I would put to someone this morning that Jesus is waiting to see your faith. Jesus is waiting to see your faith. But too often, what do we do with faith? We put faith onto the shelf as, is, as it's just this thought. It's a mental state. It's a mind state. And we leave it on the shelf and then wonder why faith is not working for us because faith is visible. Faith is what you are. Faith is what you live. Faith is how you approach life. Faith is how you get in the presence of God. Faith is the thing that brings a miracle to you through the power of God. Faith is the thing that puts you in the place of blessing with God. It all happens through faith and faith is a thing that is visible and acted upon. Faith leaves no options. No options. Think about that for just a moment. There was no other option for them. They break open that roof and they lower their friend into the presence of Jesus. Do you think those men were tired? Do you think those men were worn out? Kevin and I get the benefit and the blessing of getting to climb up in 130 degree attics. And I'm going to tell you, at the end of the day sometimes, I'm like, whew, why am I so tired? And then I'm like, oh yeah, because I've been up in hot, sweaty attics. Not every day, some days are nice. This past week wasn't too bad. But these men, he carried their buddy all the way through the city to get to the house. They exhausted every avenue trying to get in the doorway and get through the window until they said, there's no way to get through. That's okay. We'll make a way. And they went up and they started moving tile and separating tile. But the, the work was not done once they broke up the roof. Then they lowered their friend down by some ropes, whatever they had. I don't even know that they brought rope with them. But they found some rope and they lowered him down into the presence of Jesus. There was no other option option. Faith was the only option. He was being healed. He was walking home that day. He was getting himself out of that room with Jesus that all of those people were around that they dropped him into. There was no other way for him to get out or get home. Faith leaves no other option. also leaves Jesus in a position where he is not able to ignore it. Their faith put Jesus in the position where he could not ignore this need. There was no other option. You know, one of the most profound experiences of my life, my relationship with the Lord, came some years ago when Shelly and I were starting out in ministry and we'd done like everyone does, and we'd put ourselves into a tight financial situation, borrowing more than we made because we thought we had it all under control. We really didn't. And I can remember just, you know, as you're digging out of that hole, various things would happen. A vehicle would break down. We had this crusty old van. Not really. It was a good van. But occasionally it would break down. We'd say, ah. Oh, I don't have the money for repair. What are we going to do? MasterCard. 
And one day, a, a, a missionary came to the church, was preaching a sermon. He was talking about faith and miracles. He was telling all these miracles they'd got to see in ministry and everything God had done. And, you know, other people were going down praying, asking for a miracle. I went down praying, God, I want to see miracles like that. So when I went and I prayed, I did not expect God to respond. But there's only a few times in my life where I feel like God spoke audibly to me and shook me. And this particular night was one of those nights. I said, God, I want to see miracles like that. I want to experience miracles like that. And the Lord spoke to me immediately, and he said, I can do miracles just like that in your life, but every time you have a need, you turn to Visa or MasterCard or Discover, and you take another option. Jesus' name. I went to repenting, and I told my wife that night, I don't know what's going to happen, but the next time we're in trouble, we're not charging it. God, it shook me that much. Well, wouldn't you know, a day came where the option felt like maybe we should charge it. And I can remember looking at my wife and saying, nope, we're going to trust God and see what God does. And I can remember the moment we were traveling the country, doing ministry. We were out of money. We'd end up in a situation that went poorly in a service. You know, that happens sometimes in ministry. You, you go somewhere and you're expecting to get a certain kind of offering and you don't. You got bills to pay. With this particular one, we're in the place and the offering they gave us did not cover the place we were staying that we had to pay for to stay so our church I'll just tell you right now we try to go above and beyond when we have a guest speaker come to our church probably I'm going to err on the side of doing a lot more for them let's just put it that way because of experiences but I can remember we're in this place the money is spent before we got the money because we got to pay. When we leave and pull out, we got to pay for all that. But we had no food in the fridge, no food. My wife was like, let's, let's just go get a meal and we'll charge it. I said, nope, we're not going to. What do we have? She said, we've got some bread and peanut butter. Bread and peanut butter sandwich is so good until it's the only option. And all of a sudden, it does not taste very good. It starts looking really crummy, especially when your emotions get involved. Oh, peanut butter sandwich. We didn't even have jelly, so that was peanut butter. And I remember my wife being so upset, frustrated. She's crying, making a peanut butter and tears sandwich. And I'm trying to stay calm and cool on the couch. God's going to show us. God's going to do a miracle. God's in my faith is falling with every tear. And then in the middle of that, she's part of the way making, through a making a sandwich. And a guy that I had met in a restaurant who pastored in a neighboring church got my number from somebody. And he called. And he said, hey. What are y'all doing? Getting ready to eat lunch. Getting ready to eat lunch. Smile so you sound happy. Getting ready to eat lunch. Well, stop. Okay. And I'm waving at my wife. Well, stop. Cut it out. Quit making sandwiches. He said, I'm meeting my wife to take her to lunch from work. We're going to this Asian fusion restaurant. Do you like that? Sure, we love it. Come meet us. All right. God's proved himself. We're not going to have to eat peanut butter sandwiches. Yes, faith works. We got there. They feed us. We have a good meal together. 
And we go to leave, and our son was just a little boy, probably four at the time, right? Five through two. He was two. See? That's how off my memory gets. He was two. And the pastor said, hey, there's a dollar store back here. Can we go back? I want to buy your son a toy. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. So we get in the vehicles. We drive back to the dollar store. We walk around the dollar store. Wyatt picks out a ball. And he buys the ball. And he said, you know, I really thought there'd be more in here. Let's go over. And right next door was a Target, a Super Target, Great Land Super Target, massive store. It was when they first started having groceries there. He said, let's go over here. Okay. So we start walking through, and he's like, look, toys, go to the toy section. We wrap that up, he picks the toy out for Wyatt. We're walking by the baby section. He says, you, you might need some diapers. Let's get some diapers. He gets a big box of diapers, puts it in a cart. He's like, you know what? This place has food in it. I've never been in here, but I know that they're starting to carry food. Let's go over here. And he takes us, and he's going through. He's like, do you like this? Do you like this? And he's putting stuff in the cart. And it was so humbling to stand there and just have a guy do your shopping for you. He wrapped up all those groceries, bought the groceries, Thank you. We knew this is God at work. This is a miracle in the moment, and you don't know what to do. Don't cut off the miracle. That's all I can tell you. When you trust God, don't cut off the miracle. Let faith work. Let faith work. And so he loads up the groceries. We get them in our car. We get down the road. We get back, and Shelly's pulling groceries out, trying to stock our fridge, and our fridge was overflowing. Our freezer was full of meat, all the good stuff. And in the bag, he had taken and stuffed a bunch of cash in the bag. And all of a sudden, what before was crummy peanut butter sandwiches becomes a miracle. I'm pretty sure the peanut butter sandwiches went bad. Because we didn't eat them. <laughs> it's okay. I, that's the way my mind works. I start thinking about stuff in a funny way. But listen, what, the question is this, what does faith do? Faith leaves no options. And as long as we keep living our lives as if there's an option, we will not see the power and the miracles and the blessings of God as God intends for them to be in our life. Those men went there with faith as the only thing. Others came in carrying doubts. Others came in to the place wanting to inspect what Jesus was doing. Others came in just to hear and just to witness. But these men came in with faith. Their faith struggled to get them there. Their faith, once they were there, was not deterred by any obstacles. Their faith overcame, and their faith held up, and their faith was visible, and their faith left them no options. Listen, someone hear me this morning. He is here. The presence of the Lord is here. The power of the Lord is here. The power of God to work a miracle in your life is here. The power of God to heal you is here. The power to put together your broken relationships is here. What does faith do? Because the power of the Lord was present there, but he only healed him only gave a miracle to those men who brought in a friend on faith. He's here to heal, to save, to deliver, to do a great work. 
what will your faith do? Someone's faith needs to be emboldened today. It needs to be emboldened in your life. I'm getting ready to end. Your faith can carry you, but you have to move your faith to the place where it's not something that's just in your life, part of your life, but your faith is your life. Your faith drives why you're going to church. Your faith drives why it is you get up and pray in the morning. Your faith drives what it is that causes you to pick up the Bible and read while other people are just looking for things to read that are enjoyable and entertaining. Faith is the thing that tells you, I'm going to leave some things that are not helping me on the side right now and focus on the presence and power of God. Faith is the thing that puts you in a place where you say, I don't have any other options. I'm not looking for the easier option. I'm not looking for the easier way out. I'm not looking for a simple answer. I'm looking for a God answer. I'm looking for a miracle. I'm looking for God to do something that no one else can do. Faith leaves no options. Stand with me. I have no other options but to trust him, to lean on him, to see him work, to be in his presence and experience a miracle, to be in his presence and get my answers, to pray the prayer of faith and have God move. That's the only options. I'm not looking for answers that the world wants to give us. I'm not looking for answers that more educated people are trying to offer me. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not against education. But I think sometimes education, we are a little overeducated. We let that get in the way of our faith. We think we know better than God. We don't know better than God. God knows it all. He designed it from the end to the beginning. And he sees what's about to happen. He knows the answers. He saw this time today whenever he laid down the foundations of his law and his word. He saw it today. Nothing has changed. God is not caught off guard by anything that is happening. We don't know better than God. So why would I take anyone else's word that contrasts this, contradicts this, goes against this? Because they may be real worldly wise. They may be intelligent, but they're not wiser than God. Praise God. That's not in my notes. That's some extra free stuff you can take home with you and chew. Listen, I'm talking to someone today. Your faith, your faith, that's what he's going to use to do the miracle in your life. No other option, no other thing. He's going to use your faith. So Lord, help me. Help my faith. Help me. Help my belief. Help me to trust you. Faith, I have no other option. I don't have any other place to turn to, God. I didn't come to get just a a pretty word. I didn't come to just get encouraged for the week. I did not come for any other reason than I need a touch from the Lord. I need to be in your presence. I need to have your attention on me. I need you not to ignore where I'm at right now. I need an answer. I need a miracle. I need supply. I need you to do something for me. God, you see us and you know exactly where we're at. Do not ignore 